The government turns to us out of their incompetence, yet at the same time, they want to eliminate us. That is their core notion. What you have just heard is a sentiment that has become an openly known secret among the private business community in China, and vividly portrays the Chinese Communist Party's stance on private ownership. In a surprising move this July, the CCP voiced their support for the private sector. Some speculate its premier Li Qiang, hailing from Wenzhou, championing a revival of the private economy. Conversely, President Xi appears less enthusiastic about private ownership. Is this change driven by political maneuvering or an economic concession? The 1978 economic reforms initiated several prosperous periods for private businesses in China. However, over time, the brilliance of these enterprises dimmed as state-owned behemoths took center stage. This shift became particularly pronounced during the last five years of Xi Jinping's tenure, marked by a stark 180-degree policy turnaround. Private businesses were once the linchpin of China's economy, responsible for a lion's share of tax revenue, GDP, and employment opportunities. Yet, recent years have witnessed unsettling incidents targeting these enterprises. As the pandemic raged on, countless private firms collapsed, foreign investment dwindled, leading China into the worst unemployment crisis post its economic reform era. Both economic and political turmoil lurked in every corner. In a bid to avert the downturn, the Chinese government revised their stance, seeking reconciliation with the once ostracized private sector. Taking the unprecedented step of unveiling 31 pro-business policies and establishing a Bureau of Private Economy Development, they aimed to rekindle trust. But can such a pivot genuinely captivate the public and revive the economy? The market's response might have already rendered a verdict. Cyberspace is rife with sarcasm. Quote, a year ago, they aimed for a complete overhaul at any cost. Now they urge a swift return to business. A poignant remark states, quote, it feels eerily similar to domestic abuse. After inflicting pain, they confess their love. If you're gullible enough to believe it, another blow awaits. Notably, a biting critique highlights Xi Jinping's consistent pattern of initiating projects that invariably fizzle out. As with previous initiatives, this policy for private enterprises was personally overseen by Xi Jinping, only to stumble in execution. However, the most telling reaction emanates from the financial markets. Although the Chinese stock market is known for its volatility in response to policy tweaks, the A shares barely registered any significant rise post the announcement of these new measures. This unmistakably signals global skepticism, suggesting the investment community remains unconvinced. At the heart of this issue is the CCP's ambivalent approach to private businesses. History has showcased that when these enterprises curry favor with the CCP, they bask in unmatched support. Yet, when political winds shift, they're often left out in the cold. Consider the case of Country Garden, a prominent Chinese property developer. When faced with economic recessions and the onslaught of the pandemic, large state-owned housing entities faced challenges. The Chinese government, recognizing the pivotal role of private housing giants like Country Garden, sought their assistance to stabilize the volatile property market. Consequently, Country Garden enjoyed a slew of privileges and unprecedented support, which facilitated its aggressive expansion, land acquisition, and market growth. The central bank even categorized Country Garden as a national strategic asset, granting it financial support at favorable interest rates. However, as soon as state-owned housing enterprises regained their footing, the privileges extended to Country Garden were abruptly rescinded. This left the company grappling with a debt crisis, unable to access new financing or settle existing liabilities. Furthermore, it was notably excluded from central bank consultations, receiving neither financial aid nor policy incentives. Another startling example is the saga of Sun Dawu, a celebrated agrarian entrepreneur. 
In 2021, a hospital he had established garnered widespread praise for its commendable services offered at affordable prices. However, the authorities perceived this success as overshadowing the achievements of the Chinese Communist Party. As a result, senior executives and family members associated with the Dawu Group were controversially arrested. In a surprising twist, the assets of Dawu Group, valued in billions, were acquired by a company with a connection to a recently retired judge, all for a mere 686 million yuan. Ironically, this company was established merely three days prior. In the famed Huaxi village located in the Jiangnan region, assets worth 100 million yuan were astonishingly transferred for a petty 800 yuan. Despite facing hurdles, Huaxi village still boasts significant assets, which under conventional market scenarios would fetch a fair valuation. But when there's an opportunity for profit, the government appears to masterfully transfer such value. What drives this? Essentially, under the CCP's policy framework, state-owned enterprises are favored over private firms due to the vested interests and reputational benefits tied to the high-level government officials. Private entities are often regarded as temporary instruments. These enterprises can step in and fill gaps when state-owned enterprises falter, particularly during national economic or societal disruptions. But once these state-owned entities regain their momentum, influential government figures appear to perceive private enterprises as disposable, even viewing them as potential adversaries that could be suppressed without a second thought if deemed necessary. But how does the government subdue these powerful private giants? The strategy is rooted in financial manipulation, for instance, by limiting their access to finance through banking institutions, which in turn leads to capital constraints and liquidity issues. Additionally, through a maze of legal and policy restrictions, these businesses find their market worth diminished, their reputation compromised, and their growth prospects darkened. When industry giants like Alibaba and Didi contemplated listing on the global stage, they unexpectedly faced resistance from their own homeland. The underlying reason? Their substantial economic and societal footprint might have surpassed the CCP's comfort level. Private enterprises are the lifeblood of China's economic vitality. Reflect on this. In 2019, these companies contributed to 60% of the nation's GDP, generated 80% of its employment opportunities, and accounted for half of China's tax revenue. Suppressing this crucial segment could severely hamper the nation's economic heartbeat. Even more astonishing are the figures from the financial domain. By 2020's close, private businesses shouldered a staggering debt of 120 trillion yuan. The fallout from these potential bad debts could have seismic implications for China's financial landscape. Beyond being the economic powerhouses, private enterprises play a pivotal role in societal stability by employing 300 million citizens. If these vast numbers grapple with financial strains, where does that leave China's societal equilibrium? Undoubtedly, curtailing private businesses risks undermining both the economic and societal fabrics of China. The data speaks for itself. By 2019, private sectors had already etched their significant footprint on the Chinese economy. Yet the pertinent question remains, why does the Chinese Communist Party persist with its restrictive posture toward private enterprises? The reasons span beyond mere economic and societal concerns, delving into issues of power consolidation and control. As private entities burgeon, they are perceived more as potential adversaries. The ethos of a market-driven economy, unrestrained competition, and other attributes championed by private enterprises starkly contrast the Chinese Communist Party's tenets. Their ethos of diversification and inclusivity runs counter to party orthodoxy. The burgeoning influence and affluence of these businesses might jeopardize the party's rule, with repercussions potentially shaking the political structure's very foundations. Hence, the party's proactive stance to ensure its preeminence remains unchallenged. Historical instances underscore this narrative. Prior to China's reformative phase, individuals enthusiastic about trade often faced dire consequences, including capital punishment for perceived economic transgressions. In today's context, while the party endorses 31 policies championing private sectors, undertones emphasizing shared prosperity and parties' overarching leadership evoke apprehensions. 
recent stringent scrutiny of prominent private players, public denunciation of celebrated entrepreneurs, and regulatory clampdowns in specific sectors have cast an ominous cloud over this segment. As several firms grapple with the aftermath of the pandemic-induced zero-case policy, the state's unwavering stance exacerbates public disillusionment. To some in the upper echelons of power, industry stalwarts like Jack Ma, co-founder of Alibaba and Pony Ma, founder of Tencent, are perceived as inconsequential. This high-handed approach undeniably widens the chasm between the administration and its citizenry. The Chinese Communist Party's modus operandi towards private sectors is a pendulum swing, propelling their growth during economic troughs but restraining them during prosperous times. This leaves business persons perpetually treading on eggshells. Consequently, a significant cohort of entrepreneurs seeking a conducive business environment are gravitating toward nations like Singapore, Dubai, and Malta. Their grievances aren't just monetary, they resonate deeper, rooted in trepidations about China's trajectory and skepticism of its leadership. While recent overtures from Beijing hint at a more accommodating stance toward private enterprises, the entrepreneurial community remains skeptical. Their fiscal reserves might have dwindled, but the profound erosion of faith in the administration is a far graver concern. Their apprehensions are crystal clear. Once their usefulness diminishes, they might be sidelined or worse. The Chinese Communist Party's rule, in their perspective, mirrors highwaymen. Globally, as Western countries pivot away from their dependence on China, seeking to de-risk their supply chains, the ensuing economic strains on China are palpable. A prevailing sense of desolation encapsulates the society. Regardless of how the party spins it, those entrepreneurs with global footprints remain wary, fearing their next venture on home turf might be a harrowing ordeal. In the intricate web of China's political history, the relationship between private enterprises and the CCP has always been a subject of intrigue. Insightful locals pointed out, quote, There exists an inherent tension between the private sector and the CCP. While private enterprises have become the political nemesis of the CCP, economically, the party's growing dependence on them predicts a tumultuous future. International observers are even more candid. They argue that the CCP's endorsement of the private economy doesn't imply a shift in Xi Jinping's core belief against private ownership. His statements over recent years bear testament to this. On the 200th birthday anniversary of Marx in 2018, Xi firmly declared, quote, Marx was right. Fast forward to the 20th National Congress of the CCP in 2022, he doubled down, underscoring the elimination of private ownership as the party's central tenet. The chessboard is set, and every piece knows its position. Beyond the walls of the CCP, trust is a rare commodity. In this intricate power play, the establishment of the Private Economy Development Bureau by the National Development and Reform Commission, NDRC, seems to be a gesture of goodwill, but there's more than meets the eye. Naturally, this bureau holds significant authority, being under the aegis of the NDRC, a department widely perceived as an epicenter of power by the public. Every office within the commission wields substantial decision-making power and is equipped with ample funding. This not only grants them the authority to make pivotal decisions, but also positions them as a critical link in policy approval processes. One might wonder, why not establish a private economy development ministry at the ministerial level for a more direct impact? Such a move could evoke concerns of privatized entities becoming quasi-state-owned. Li Chang's reluctance to adopt this approach speaks volumes. Creating a bureau falls within his administrative powers, while a ministry requires President Xi's nod. This paints a picture of Li, with his roots in Wenzhou, a cradle of China's private enterprise spirit, attempting to navigate this tightrope, rejuvenating the private economy, albeit cautiously. Yet the discerning can sense that bureaucratic tweaks may not be enough to restore market faith. Complex structures might only open doors to more red tape, rendering the new bureau's creation a myopic decision. Insider sources reveal that the state council's economic think tank once posed a challenge to Lee. Why establish a bureau? To truly revive the economy, efforts should be directed towards clearing the names of the private entrepreneurs who have been misunderstood and unjustly treated. Allegedly, the vindication of 10 such entrepreneurs within the country could potentially trigger an immediate economic resurgence. 
Although Li's commitment to the private sector is evident, he seems unwilling to bear the brunt of political fallout. The case of Sun Dawu is illustrative. While President Xi never directly intervened and the real puppeteers were believed to be from Hebei, Li remained circumspect, even reportedly seeking Jack Ma's counsel. China's private economy is undeniably its backbone, yet both Li Qiang's and Xi's strategy face mounting scrutiny. It isn't bureaucratic labyrinths that will spur growth, but a level playing field for its entrepreneurs. The million-dollar question remains, can the CCP muster the audacity and authenticity to genuinely champion progress and innovation?